Hello and welcome back to the Genomics Bootcamp. This time it will be a little bit of a different video as usual. It will be an opinion piece where I say what I think about the use of microsatellites in the current era of genomics. This is actually my second attempt for the same video. Actually, I have done one uh, yesterday. But, uh, well, at the end, it was uh, way too long and a uh, tad bit uh, too enthusiastic. So I thought, well, I give it another go. Actually, the original video will be also used. I am thinking about uploading it as a members only video for the channel. So if you're interested in that and also interested in supporting the channel, then check out the join button below this video for more information. But let's start with the content part of the video and the title I gave it, that is the microsatellites rand, AKA why are these still a thing? It will consist of two parts. Well, first there will be an entry from an FAO publication that discusses more or less the same thing. And then another entry from a LinkedIn post that I found also basically complaining about the same thing. And uh, we will briefly go through these texts and uh, well, I will give some commentary as we go. So the FAO publication I talked about is the genomic characterization of animal genetic resources. This came out in, I think, 2023. And actually I will talk about this publication in a great more detail in an upcoming short video series. But for this occasion, I want to talk about the box one in this publication called Microsatellites, Glory and Decline. It is not a very long text and I invite you to read it in full, but uh, for this occasion and also keeping this video relatively short, so I will read and comment just on some of the parts of this text. So the text states, microsatellites are a type of genetic marker discovered in the 1980s. They consist of repetitive units of two to six base pairs and are thus also known as STRs for short tandem repeat or SSR for short sequence repeat. Because of their abundance and fast PCR-based scoring, they revolutionized the genetic localization of heritable traits. In the 1990s, hundreds of microsatellites were discovered and published for the most common livestock species. Since 2000, they have been used for many genetic diversity studies. Now I would like to stop here. So basically my main problem with microsatellites, not, not that they would not work or if they are not relevant or were not relevant at the time, but this is a very old technology that somehow stuck and we are somehow using it still today. If you think about it, even if we take the 1990s, this was 30, 35 years ago. It is a very long time and we have achieved a great deal of progress since then. And yet somehow microsatellites are still in use. And at the same time, there are some much better alternatives available for more or less the same price tag. As for a comparison, just imagine using a communication device or a mobile phone from the 1990s. I have jumped forward in the text to talk about this paragraph. It says, on the other hand, indirect benefits of microsatellites should not be overlooked. They raised high expectations for genetic characterization and thus catalyzed the formation of a network of international collaborations and consortia, which still are in place. This paved the way for a rapid and most productive implementation of genome-wide and whole genome sequencing. My point here is, and I would like to underline that I do not think that the microsatellites are absolutely useless, or at least they were not useless at the time. I'm just saying that we have much better alternatives nowadays. And of course, microsatellites had their place in the history of genomics, but today it is a history and not even a current day technology. So we went back to the beginning of this box to talk about the uses of microsatellites. Basically, the microsatellites can be credited with considerable scientific progress and have also been relevant for management of livestock genetic resources. And there are several points here. And the first one is that being used or very used for rapid tests for paternity and identity still being done. 
Well, this is my main point here. And I think this is basically the saving grace of microsatellites in the eyes of uh, people who still use it, that basically they were used all the time. And then of course, something was in place long time ago, and there is no reason why it should be replaced. In my view, it is a very compelling reason why to replace them. Namely, that microsatellites could be used for this purpose, for, for this pattern testing. Not always, I will talk about it a bit later, but basically, yes, they could be used for pattern testing, for example, but nothing else really. Well, there are here some examples that they could be used for heterozygosity and FIS and others. But the thing is, we have like, I don't know, 20, 30 microsatellites on the genome. That means that, let's say, on average, one microsatellite per chromosome. So that is an absolutely low coverage and the microsatellites do not tell anything at all about any other characteristics of the, of the genome for the particular animal or the population. We have, on the other hand, for example, SNP chips that could be nowadays produced for a comparable price. And these SNP chips could be used for all kinds of diversity measures for GWAS, for selection signatures. So you genotype the animal with a SNP chip once and you can enjoy the benefits for many other purposes. Also, there is a plenty of open access genotypes nowadays online. So basically you genotype your own population and you can pull in all the open access data from the world. And suddenly you have thousands of genotypes to which you can compare your own population that was newly genotyped. This is one of the shortcomings of the microsatellites, honestly, that it is actually very hard to pull the data from other sources unless these data was genotyped also for the same set of microsatellites. Normally, they are not. There is this set of FAO microsatellites that was uh, suggested all the time, but uh, if this was not used, then, well, tough luck. You don't have comparable set. Also, on this paternity testing, this could be done also with SNP chips, and you don't even need a SNP chip set that was specially designed for the paternity testing. As I show this in this video, on the channel, basically you can use the full SNP chip data, the very conventional set of SNPs that come with any type of diversity analysis for your species. And you can do a test for Mendelian inconsistencies. And from that one, you could clearly see if two animals are parent and offspring or not. So for at least 10 years now, since the SNP chips are widely av available for a reasonable price, this argument of keeping the microsatellites for paternity testing does not stand. Here there is also a set of points about the limitations of microsatellites. So the first one, with typically no more than one marker per chromosome in most characterization studies, microsatellites do not attain genomic coverage. Yes. Scoring alleles cannot be automated and is error prone. Yes. Estimates of genetic diversity depend on the panel of microsatellite markers, so comparisons are valid only with a data set. Panels recommended by FAO have not been universally adopted. Yes. Absolute allele sizes are not consistent across laboratories, even if the same equipment was used. Consequently, results of different labs with the same marker panel can only be combined with, by sharing reference samples or by using allelic ladders as a size standard. Yes, because of the low number of markers used in most studies, typically 15 to 30, genetic distances between individuals cannot be estimated reliably. Also due to the limited number of markers, localization of genetic traits is very imprecise. Exactly. They, meaning the microsatellites, are not suitable at all for the recently developed and statistically powerful modes of analysis. Again, yes. So with all these limitations, why? Why are the microsatellites still a thing? We are following up with the LinkedIn post that I have came across some months ago from the National Association of Animal Breeders. They ask pretty much the similar question, stating, did you know many countries still require microsatellite testing for import? 
but SNPs, meaning single nucleotide polymorphisms, are cheaper, easier, and faster. So why? Excellent question. They go on to describe their case, and basically they are telling the same thing. And uh, well, we are not going to read all of this now on screen or in, during the video, that, but we are, I invite you to do so. But basically what they do here is complain as much as a company could on a public post, telling that, well, microsatellites just do not make sense in the current time. I just highlight this bullet point here telling SNPs became popular in 2009 as a faster, more efficient, and more affordable alternative. SNP genotypes are easy to automate, automate cheaper, and can serve multiple purposes beyond parentage. Exactly. Which is why many labs, including those in the US and everywhere else, now rely on them. They go on and state some of the possible reasons, and we will go through these. Namely, they mention transition costs, marker gaps, revenue streams, labor demands, and species limitations as reasons. With some of these reasons, I agree, and with some, absolutely not. So we will go one by one. Transition costs. Moving to SNP requires investment in time, technology, and training, which can be challenging for some countries. Yes, of course, you need time, but we had this time. We had this time for the past 15 years. During that time, all the research publications and all the conferences I have been to and everything else was either on SNPs or something more advanced even. Also, there is plenty of resources to learn and plenty of resources to find out how to do these things. For example, I published this video on the parentage testing with SNPs. Also, if you don't know anything about SNP analysis, but you want to, I invite you also to check out the videos on this channel. So there are the playlists for genomics for absolute beginners, basically starting without any previous knowledge on the SNP analysis. Of course, you need, need to know something about genetics, but if you do not know anything at all about the analysis of genomic data based on SNPs, you can learn also on this channel. So this is not something that is a great limitation in my opinion. The second one, marker gaps. Not all SNP arrays currently cover every needed parentage marker, which sometimes necessitates fallback to microsatellites, keeping them relevant. Again, here I would not agree. It might be that there are no SNPs in the region of the current microsatellite markers, but you actually do not need them. You can just use SNP chips and of course, the, the parent and the offspring or the supposed parent and offspring need to be genotyped with the SNP chip. And then you can do the analysis very easily. Of course, if you want to transition, there might be a transition period that for some time you genotype the animals with a microsatellite and also a SNP to have a, some kind of consistency, but you can phase it out really quickly afterwards. So I would think that the microsatellites are not relevant at all. The number three and number four I will discuss together. So the first one is number three, revenue streams. Some companies continue to profit from microsatellite testing services and thus keep the technology in demand. And the fourth one is kind of connected. Labor demands, microsatellite testing involves more manual work, which maintains jobs in certain sectors. Yes, I mean, it is a problem if somebody loses their job or suddenly is not in demand. And this is honestly the hardest part in the change. It would be hardest part in the change. But again, so this is not a sudden change. And there is plenty of other things in genomics that can be done. And number five, species limitations. SNP chips aren't available yet for all species, meaning microsatellites remain necessary for some. Here, I would also say no. Uh, well, I don't have a total overview if the SNP chips are available for absolutely every species. But again, there are other technologies that are certainly viable. For example, you can do, I don't know, low coverage sequencing or any similar matter if a SNP chip would not be available. And also I would be willing to bet that nowadays in 2025, there is a SNP chip available for every major livestock species if it is not available for absolutely 
every species, then this, this species must be a niche. Also at the end, I would like to highlight some of the work we have done in the area. So some years back, I was part of the IMAGE project, the Innovative Management of Animal Genetic Resources. And of course, just on a side note, whoever worked in this project knows that the current correct pronunciation is IMAGE. Anyway, main point is within this project, there was a multi-species chip developed that has 10,000 markers, SNP markers for multiple species in a single chip. That means that it can be obtained for a very reasonable price and be a replacement, for example, for the microsatellite markers. Of course, these markers were selected in a planned way in order to allow imputation for larger chips or merging with open access data. And in these chips, we took special care that the less represented livestock species are also included. So for the cross-checking of the species limitations mentioned in this point five, I would really invite you to check out the resources from the image project and maybe you will find what you are looking for. And now we are at the end of this video. At the end, it was not as short as I thought, but uh, certainly better than the yesterday's trial on this. So definitely let me know what you think. Uh, leave your comments down below. As I mentioned, this is an opinion piece. So of course, if you disagree, let me know. If you agree, let me know. If you like the video, press the like button. If you like the channel, press the subscribe button. And if you would like to support even more the work that is being done here within this channel, then I invite you to check out the, the join button and become a Genomics Bootcamp channel member. For now, I thank you for your time and I wish you a really nice day.